Bonjour. My name is Pam Ronald. I'm a plant geneticist. I study genes that make the plant resistant to disease or tolerant of stress. Over the last few years, millions of people around the world have come to believe that there's something sinister about genetic modification. Today, I want to give you a different perspective. But first, let me introduce you to my husband, Raul. He's an organic farmer. He plants a diversity of crops. Uh, this is just one of many ecologically-based methods of farming. So you can imagine some of the questions that we get. An organic farmer and a geneticist, do you even talk to each other? Well, we do. And it's not difficult because we have the same goal. We want to nourish the growing population without further destroying the environment. I believe this is the greatest challenge of our time. Now, genetic improvement is not new. Everything we eat has been genetically altered using some, in some manner. And we've been doing this for a long time. So take a look on the left of the ancient ancestor of modern corn. The ancient ancestor produces a hundredfold less grain, and to get at the grain, you have to break it open with a hammer. This shows you the ancient ancestor of modern banana and the ancient ancestor of the beautiful eggplant that we eat today. Now to create these varieties, farmers and breeders have used many different types of genetic modification. Some of them are incredibly radical. So think about grafting. So this shows, gra with grafting, you can take two different species and produce a single plant, like this potato and tomato that have been grafted together. You can harvest the potato from the ground and the tomato from the top. Another method that's been used for uh, over 100 years is radiation mutagenesis, where seeds are subjected to radiation, which creates random genetic changes across the genome. Many of us fed our babies cereal that was developed using this technique. Now, I, I want to tell you um, a little bit about some of the work in my lab. I study rice, which is the staple food for half the world's people. Every year, it's estimated that about 50% of the potential yield is lost to pest disease and environmental stress. So for example, flooding is a, is a major problem for farmers in South and Southeast Asia. Although most rice varieties will grow well in um, standing water, most varieties will die if they're completely submerged for more than three days. And this is a particular problem in flood-prone areas of the world where 70 million farmers live uh, many surviving on less than $2 a day. So for many years, breeders were trying to develop a rice variety that can tolerate this complete submergence. My colleagues David McKill at the University of California, Davis, and Kenang Shu had been studying an ancient variety of rice that had an amazing property. This rice could survive two weeks of complete flooding. But this was a primitive variety that didn't produce grain that farmers uh, and consumers could use. So they asked me if I could help them isolate the gene. And I said, yes, this is a very exciting project because if we were successful, we hoped that we could potentially produce a rice that would help millions of farmers and their families uh, produce uh, more rice. So Kanang, I worked in Dave's and my lab for about 10 years. One day he came into my office and said, you have to look at these plants I've developed. So I did, I went to the greenhouse and he showed me the conventional rice variety that after 14 days of flooding, you could see it, it looked very sick and in fact, these, these plants eventually die. But the rice plant that he engineered with a new gene that we named sub-1A for submergence tolerance A, could survive the flooding. 
So this was a really very exciting time for us. We knew that we had isolated a gene that conferred this very important trait. But I work in a, a laboratory and greenhouse environment. The question was, would this work to help farmers uh, in the field? So I'm going to show you a time-lapse video that was carried out at the International Rice Research Institute in the Philippines. And it shows you a variety developed by my colleague David McKill using another genetic technique called marker-assisted breeding. So on the left, you see the new variety carrying the sub-1 gene, and on the right, the conventional variety. Both varieties grow very well at first, but then a flood comes, and you could see after that two-week flood, the conventional variety does not produce much grain, but the sub-1 variety produces a high yield. Now, I like to show this video because it shows the power of genetics. This is why there are geneticists, plant geneticists, doing this kind of work. Last year, with helps from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, five million farmers grew sub-1 rice and they're able to harvest about threefold more grain. This tr resilient trait is, is very important because as the climate changes, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change predicts that there will be more flooding and increased flooding. So you might think, okay, well that's okay, that's a rice gene and a rice plant, I'm okay with that, but what about putting genes from viruses and bacteria into plants, why would you do that? Well, the reason is, is sometimes it's the safest, uh, most economical and effective approach for controlling a particular pest or disease. So let me give you a few examples. This is papaya, uh, we eat a lot of this in California, very nice. But this one is infected with papaya ring spot virus. This virus devastated papaya orchards in Hawaii in the 1950s. At the time, there was no way to control this disease, and most people thought that Hawaiian papaya was doomed. But then, a plant pathologist, a local Hawaiian na named Dennis Gonzalves, decided to try to engineer resistance to this disease using the technique of genetic engineering. So he took a small snippet of a viral DNA and he put it into the papaya genome. This shows you one of his field trials in 1997. In the center is the genetically engineered papaya that's immune to infection. On the outside is the conventional papaya that produces 20-fold less fruit. Dennis Gonzalves is created with rescuing the papaya industry. Even today, 20 years later, there's no other method to control this disease. There's no organic approach and there's no conventional approach. 90% of the papaya in Hawaii is genetically engineered. Now you might think, well, you know, yuck, I don't, I don't, I don't really want to eat a viral protein. But if you're still queasy, consider that if you bite into a conventional or an organic papaya, you're chewing on tenfold more viral protein. Okay, so now look at this. This is an insect caterpillar feasting on an eggplant. The black you see is frass. That's what comes out the back end of the insect. Now, this is a very serious pest for farmers in Bangladesh. Eggplant is the most important vegetable in Bangladesh. And to control this disease, this pest, farmers will spray insecticides two to three times a week. But insecticides, we know some insecticides can be very harmful, especially to farmers and their families in less developed parts of the world where they can't uh, afford access to safety controls. The World Health Organization estimates that 300,000 people die every year from overuse or misuse of insecticides. Cornell and Bangladeshi scientists decided to try to reduce chemical sprays on Bangladesh by using a genetic approach that builds on an organic farming technique. 
So organic farmers, like my husband, often spray a pesticide called BT that's derived from a bacteria. But this doesn't work very well for Bangladeshi farmers in eggplant. That's because BT sprays are difficult to find in Bangladesh, they're expensive, and they're not very effective because they don't prevent the insect from getting inside the eggplant. So what Bangladeshi and Cornell scientists decided to do was to clip out the gene that encodes BT and express it directly in the eggplant. So how does this work? Well, now there's been three years of field trials, and farmers in Bangladesh have found they've been able to eliminate their use of insecticides, or at least dramatically reduce the amount of sprays, often down to zero. Okay, so I gave you some examples of how modern genetics can be used to control um, against environmental stress, pests and disease, but genetic engineering is also being used to reduce malnutrition. It's estimated that 500,000 children every year go blind because of lack of vitamin D. Half of those children will die each year. Now, with the support from the Rockefeller Foundation, scientists decided to genetically engineer rice with genes that will allow the plant to produce pro-vitamin A, beta-carotenoid. This is the same compound that we eat in carrots, for example. The rice produced is golden, and it's estimated that one cup of golden rice per day can save the lives of thousands of children around the world. Yet just a few years ago, there were field trials in the Philippines that were destroyed by uh, groups that were opposed to modern genetics. And I wondered when I heard about that if the people knew that they were destroying more than an important research project, they were actually destroying medicines that can save the sight and the lives of millions of children. Now often my friends and family asked me, well, how do you know foods with new genes are safe to eat? They're worried. Well, consider that the process of genetic engineering has been used for more than 40 years in cheeses, in medicines, and in plants. In all that time, there hasn't been a single instance of harm to human health or the environment. But I remind them, well, you don't need to believe me. My opinion doesn't matter. Science is not a belief system. We need to look at the evidence. Well, after 40 years of careful study and independent review by thousands of independent scientists, every major scientific organization in the world, including the European Food Safety Authority, has concluded that the process of genetic engineering is no more risky than older methods of genetic techniques. Every technique must be looked at on a case-by-case -case basis. And these are the same scientific organizations that most of us trust when it comes to other important scientific issues, such as the safety of vaccines or the changing climate. So Raul and I believe that instead of worrying about the genes in our food, we must focus on how we can help nourish our children. We must think about how we can help farmers and rural communities survive. We must think about how we can help more people afford food, and we must minimize environmental degradation. What scares me most about the spread of misinformation about plant genetics is that the poorest people in the world who m will probably most benefit from the technology may not have access because of the vague fears and prejudices of those who have enough to eat. We have huge challenges ahead of us. Let's celebrate science and use it. It's our responsibility to alleviate human suffering and safeguard the environment. Thank you.